driving experience to the Central Valley. The grid. 50 competition sailplanes assemble for a massive airlift. The tow planes used to tow the competition sailplanes to altitude arrive at the airfield. The launch begins. It takes nearly an hour to put all 50 competitors in the air. Riding only on air currents, most of the sailplanes will stay aloft for hours. Failing to find lift, some will not complete the course. They will be forced to land in an open field or pasture. The sailplane will be disassembled, and with some humiliation, the pilot will be forced to trailer the sailplane back to the airport. Heat from the mid-morning sun warms the Earth's surface. The rising heat will create thermals, rising columns of air that keep the sailplanes aloft. All the sailplanes entered in the day's competition are launched. Circling in thermals above the field, the sailplanes gain altitude in the rising columns of air. Soon they disappear from sight and begin a race against the clock to complete the designated course, sometimes as long as 300 miles. The skilled and the lucky pilots will stay aloft for hours, riding the air currents. They will not return to the home airport until the late afternoon or early evening. Soaring is made possible by a grant from the New York State Public Television Stations. Now, Orville always did the cooking, and he was, uh, had a regular system. And to tell the truth, Orville was a very good cook. Of course, the first few days we were down there, the plane hadn't arrived, and uh, we used to go out fishing on the sound there. That's me and Uncle Orv way back there, and my dad in between us there. Before the uh, plane came down, we had three or four days of fishing. I remember one evening, well, afternoon, we came back, and there was a uh, horse uh, with a dray there, uh, hauling it, you could see the big box. And uh, f from then on, they concentrated on flying, uh, gliding and playing with it, you might say. The Wright brothers started their flying experiments with glider flight prior to their famous power flight of 1903. It's interesting to note that in 1911, while Wilbur was in France demonstrating their engine-driven aircraft, Orville returned to Kitty Hawk. The purpose of Orville's return was not to fly an engine-driven aircraft, but to experiment with sustained glider flight. He was intrigued with the notion of continuous flight without an engine. During his 1911 glider experiments, 
Orville set a record for staying aloft in a glider by riding air currents for nearly 10 minutes. Orville Wright predicted in his journal that advanced skills by pilots to ride air currents in more sophisticated aircraft would allow pilots to soar for hours and to cover miles without the use of an engine. Soaring became a national pastime in Germany following the First World War. By 1930, the popularity had spread to the United States. A veteran German glider pilot, Wolfgang Hirth, came to the United States to help the Americans find the prime soaring site. After searching the Finger Lakes region in upper New York State, he found the ideal conditions for glider flight, a high, flat ridge top above a broad, level valley. This place is known as Harris Hill, overlooking Elmira, New York. During the 1930s, Harris Hill became the center of glider activity in the United States. Until the early 60s, the glider enthusiasts that gathered at Elmira were responsible for the growth and development of American glider flight and Harris Hill became known as the soaring capital of the world. The first national soaring championships were staged at the Elmira, New York site in the late 1930s, and many followed during the next half century. At that time, there weren't schools around, and uh, we just built one and read as much we could about it, and uh, of course, the first flights we made were just slides a few feet off the ground. We used the shock cord method, which was a elastic rope, and got some of the neighborhood kids to give us a launch. And uh, of course, uh, after the novelty wore off, we had trouble getting uh, enough candidates to pull the shock cord. So by that time, Ernie was old enough to drive a car. So we used uh, an old model a car to pull out the shock cord. Well, <clears throat> we used to build model airplanes, and uh, and my brother Ernie uh, built a six-foot uh, flying model, and uh, it flew very well. And the next thing you know, he was a senior in high school at the time, and I was about in uh, sixth or seventh grade, and Paul was a junior in high school, and uh, uh, next thing we were building a. A primary glider. And the primary glider is an open cockpit, a glider where you sit on the fuselage structure, which is all open. And uh, we lived through it and uh, progressed, and that's how we got into the business. Three brothers, Ernie, Paul, and Bill Schweitzer, were attracted to the glider activity at Elmira. The Schweitzer brothers made a significant contribution to glider flight in the United States by designing and manufacturing safe gliders. During the 1930s, the Schweitzer aircraft plant was constructed in Elmira, New York, within sight of Harris Hill. Until the late 60s, 
there were very few American glider pilots who were not trained in Schweitzer aircraft. Although the Schweitzer plant no longer builds gliders, many of their ships are still in use throughout the world. Because the Schweitzer gliders are very forgiving of typical students' mistakes, the Elmira aircraft plant was responsible for the rapid spread of glider flight throughout the United States. Well, the Schweitzer brothers, in my opinion, have really made it possible for the U.S. public to fly sailplanes in this country. Uh, they have always designed aircraft that is very safe, that you can make lots of mistakes in, and smilingly walk away, you might say. Um, they are easy to fly, easy to get into the soaring aspect of it. There are ships, sir are structurally, we try to build them structurally sound and that will give pilot protection in the crash and also we try to build them aerodynamically sound so they are forgiving from a flight standpoint so they don't have any bad flight characteristics and that's why they've, they've been very, uh, you know, they've been well recognized as an outstanding training sail, uh, aircraft. The hills surrounding Elmira, New York, provided favorable terrain for the glider pilots that were attracted to Harris Hill. Winds blowing up the face of the hills surrounding Elmira provided ridge lift and the flat valley and fields, thermals. Because of better terrain and weather conditions for soaring in many other locations, Elmira is no longer recognized as the best soaring location in the United States. However, Harris Hill is recognized as the center for housing the history of American glider flight. The National Soaring Museum adjacent to historic Harris Hill contains many important gliding artifacts. The purpose of the museum is to protect the history of soaring and to educate the general public on uh, the beauty of motorless flight. Um, our collection is quite extensive. We have 39 sailplanes in just the uh, aircraft collection. Our collection is uh, of historic value nationwide, not just Harris Hill. Well, you know, each person uh, soars for perhaps a different reason. Uh, to me, it represents a tremendous amount of freedom that I cannot really get on the ground. This is a three-dimensional environment with essentially no, uh, no limits. Well, one of the problems involved in soaring is that you not only have to evaluate your situation at the present time, but you have to evaluate it in an hour or two hours. Many times the, uh, the mountain amplifies the rising air currents, makes them much, much better. So we'll fish around here a little bit. Uh, there is something. We actually gained a little bit on that one. Now we'll bank it in to stay inside the rising air. We have gained 100 feet so far. Sailplanes seem to defy logic. Although they may weigh nearly a ton, they can stay up almost indefinitely by riding invisible air currents. The bumps that annoy airline passengers are in fact rising columns of air called thermals. Skilled soaring pilots learn to circle in these areas of lift, 
often climbing hundreds of feet with each turn. Rising columns of air produce puffy clouds called fair weather cumulus. They are powerful enough to lift a ton of sailplane as easily as a hawk or an eagle. You notice that I have a fairly steep angle of bank. In this particular uh, thermal, it's necessary because it's very narrow. And if I shallow my angle of bank, I cannot stay inside of it. After climbing in a thermal, the soaring pilot then trades off his altitude for high-speed cross-country flight. As his altitude gradually diminishes, he is already searching for more lift from the next thermal. What we'll do is we'll level off and go uh, above the mountain. We'll go a little bit farther away from the airport. This modern two-seater is climbing above a desert ridge near Phoenix, Arizona. The wind blowing against the face of the mountain is deflected up and causes what is called ridge lift. The sailplane is riding the ridge lift at a rate of climb of nearly 1,000 feet per minute. Many conventional airplanes at full throttle can't match that sort of climb. This is fun. Sailplanes are designed with low landing speeds for safety when landing away from airports. A surprise visit to a pasture or plowed field poses no great threat to the pilot or his aircraft, but does require training and skill to execute safely. Most flights are made within reach of the home airport until hours of practice will allow the pilot to fly cross country. Flying cross-country in a sailplane is the intentional act of leaving the security of your home airport. When you've been flying local for any length of time, you, you get very attached to the airport. It becomes your home base. It becomes like, you know, your mother. You just don't want to leave, leave the home base. And your first cross-country is probably the worst because you're actually moving away from it and you know there's no turning back. And, um, it's a great feeling when you've made your first cost country and you've landed, made a perfect landing. You know, it's a fantastic feeling. Um, it's, it's really hard to describe. And the more you do it, every time you land out, it's just as exciting as the first one. leaving the home airport, the sailplane pilot must continuously search for lift from rising air currents. There is no guarantee, however, and the lift provided by nature could end as weather conditions vary. Even if lift exists, it takes skill and practice to know where to find it in order to make a cross-country flight. The sailplane pilot must constantly be prepared to make any field a landing strip. While you're, you're flying, you're constantly looking for a place to land in case uh, you're unable to get any more lift. And as you get closer to the ground, 2,000, you start to realize that, well, I may not be able to find any more lift. Um, so you start picking, picking a field that looks good. And then as you get closer to the ground, then you've pretty much committed yourself to that area. And you've got to look for the type of field that, what kind of crops uh, are in the field. Uh, you've got to look for wires. Uh, make sure that when you're coming in for your landing that you're not, you know, there isn't any wires in the way. Uh, th just a number of things you've got to look out for for a safe landing. Landing in an open field away from an airport is an adventure in itself. First experience, um, I landed south about 16 miles from, from Dansville. And I was on the ridge thermaling with the hawks and wasn't getting anywhere and started to realize that at 800 feet that it was really time for me to uh, land. I had picked a, 
a field that was uh, mowed, so uh, it looked like a good place to land, and I checked for all the wires and checking that it was level, and I landed, and it was great. I had no problems whatsoever. Um, I got out, and next thing you know, I had this, uh, an old gentleman come out with his uh, younger son who had owned the land and was totally in, a, in awe that it was a woman pilot. After landing, the sailplane is disassembled and put on a trailer, then returned to the home field. Most modern sailplanes are constructed with fiberglass resin composites, which combines great strength with light weight and yields an almost perfect surface finish. The result is an ideal combination of high lift and low drag. In the past 20 years, sailplane performance has improved nearly 100%. The evolution of sailplanes, which has been underway for more than a century, has recently turned into a revolution. To a soaring pilot, his sailplane is the most beautiful object ever crafted by the hand of man. In the eternal quest for higher performance, sailplane designers try to conjure up more perfect streamlining and thereby reduce the wind resistance that pilots call drag. In their zeal to reduce drag, sailplane designers have narrowed sailplane cockpits so drastically that pilots no longer really get into them. Instead, they put them on. The streamlined design of this Salto aerobatic sailplane is an example of the nearly unlimited performance of modern design. At high speed, the Salto sounds like a jet. Because of the increased performance of sailplanes, more and more sailplanes are entering aerobatic competition. past 18 years I've been sorting practically every day and there's been a tremendous change uh, the sailplanes have progressed from about 40 to 1 glide ratio in uh, the late 60s early 70s on uh, up to 60 to 1 glide ratio it means from a mile altitude you can glide 60 miles without getting any additional lift the other advancement, uh, of course, have been in uh, instrumentation. Today in competition, we fly with a, uh, an air data computer that allows us to confidently start our glide home far enough in the distance where we cannot even see the place where we're going. My best glide I've ever made was about 80 nautical miles being on final glide as fast as the aircraft allowed me to go because my computer said it's okay for me to do that. And sure enough, I got home okay. After a full day in the air, the leaders reappear, whistling across the finish line at maximum speed and minimum altitude. What looks like smoke trailing behind the sailplane is actually water ballast, now being drained to lighten the ship for landing. When the thermals are strong, the heavier ships outfly the lighter ones, which is the purpose of ballast. Water is preferred as ballast because it is heavy and easy to release when not needed. 
Gliders today are called sailplanes because of their seemingly unlimited ability to stay aloft. These competition sailplanes have been in flight for hours, covering hundreds of miles, racing for the fastest time to complete the designated course. The sleek competition sailplanes return to the home base airport. They cross the finish line at speeds of over 100 miles per hour. The top competition sailplane pilots are considered to be highly skilled pilots, respected worldwide within the soaring community. However, even the best competition sailplane pilot receives little reward beyond personal satisfaction. We hope you enjoyed tonight's episode of Soaring. Stay with us on Channel 18 for Nova, coming up later tonight at 11 o'clock. It's a repeat of last night's episode titled, The Brutal Craft, Pioneers of Surgery. But next to 10, the Irish RM, right here on your public television station for the San Joaquin Valley, Channel 18. Okay, we're going to level off and head back towards the sailport.